Well, good afternoon. Is this a uh, working microphone? Oh, it's more for the Zoom. Okay, great. Hopefully people on Zoom can hear okay. Um, welcome everybody. We're really excited to have you join us today in our first uh, data science seminar from uh, the Center for Emerging and Infectious Diseases. I want to also acknowledge uh, many people who are joining us online. Excited to have you all here. Uh, this event is being organized by the Data Science Corps, the Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases. This center was founded by Nahid Bedelia, uh, sort of in response to the pandemic, the COVID crisis, and I think recognition that we need a lot more work being done to uh, improve our resilience and preparation for pandemic threats and emerging infectious disease threats. Uh, the Data Science Corps just started this year. Uh, Kaoko Shioda and I are leading this effort, and our goals are really to develop more strong data pipelines, data analysis methods, and uh, tool development to inform pandemic preparation, detection, and response. Uh, I think the field of data science is clearly very exciting. There's a lot of rapidly emerging technologies and ideas, and applying this in pandemic preparedness is really critically important. And we're really fortunate to have three great speakers today who work in various areas in this. Um, I also just, as a side note, want to bring your attention to a research on tap being hosted this afternoon at 4 p.m. on the Charles River campus by the Office of Research that is showcasing more broadly data science efforts in health. So pandemic preparedness being one of those areas, but a, a whole lot of other thrusts that are exciting. Um, feel free to reach out to me after the event if you want to know more in our underwear. Um, as I mentioned, this is our first event of the Data Science Corps for SEED. Um, we're really excited to highlight some of the great work that is being done by researchers at Boston University in this area of pandemic preparedness and response. And this includes development of novel surveillance systems, innovative data structures, and the use of AI in pandemic settings. So for the format today, we're going to have each speaker talk for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open up to Q&A for the remainder of the time. So make sure you get your questions ready. We hope to have a lively and exciting discussion afterwards. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kaoko to introduce our first speaker. Well, thank you so much. So it's my honor to introduce Dr. David Hamer, the Professor of Global Health and Medicine at BU. And Dr. Hamer is a board certified specialist in infectious diseases with a particular focus on tropical infectious diseases. He has an extensive field experience in maternal, neonatal, and child survival research. And Dr. Hamer is also the surveillance lead for the GeoSentinel Surveillance Network. And this global network conducts surveillance of emerging infectious diseases using returning travelers, immigrants, and refugees as sentinels of infection. And he has been working with the CDC on um, addressing the current monkeypox outbreak, COVID-19, and dengue in travelers. And at SEED, David and I co-direct the research core uh, for One Health, Climate Change, and EIDs. And David has also uh, recently been appointed as the new scientific program chair for the ASTMH, American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So he will be uh, responsible for all aspects of the educational and the scientific program content at the society's annual meeting, which is really exciting. So please join me welcoming Dr. David Hamer. Hopefully this will work. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to just uh, talk for a few minutes about GeoSentinel, um, and you know, I thought it'd be a good example of a system that's sort of an atypical surveillance system that was established by the CDC. Uh, in the mid 90s in response to concerns, uh, actually the Institute of Medicine report about emerging infectious diseases. And so they sort of thought through different aspects of how they could do surveillance in different ways. And that led to GeoSentinel being established. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit of background on the surveillance system. And then I'm gonna talk about a few examples of how it's been used in recent years and then what we're doing now, which is some really exciting new both um, analyses, but also um, enhanced surveillance. So just just as background, so this is a global surveillance system, but it looks at returning travelers. So the people uh, that we are seeing have to have traversed an international border. It can be migrants and refugees as well, and then be seen at a site that has to have, that has adequate volume and diagnostic capacity. So so you may wonder why there's so many sites in North America and Europe 
and very few in the rest of the world. Well, that's because these these locations, they may see lots of local people, but they don't see travelers very much. And, and we've actually been trying hard to get sites in Brazil, but it's been really hard to see a place to find a location in Brazil. And India is another example that sees a lot of people that are on the move, um, other than the local population. Um, and we collect the identified patient information. I won't go into all the details, but basically there's a sort of a whole process for that. And I'll, I'll show the flow of data in a minute. Um, we try and link the time and place of exposure. We have uh, very specific definitions of diseases, both confirmed and probable. And that allows us to identify both central events, like outbreaks of known diseases in new places, and sometimes even new diseases, um, and then patterns of disease over time. We have members, these are the red dots, and so those, those are sites that actively uh, provide data on a regular, on a routine basis. And then affiliate members that don't provide data, but they alert us to any anything really novel that they've seen. So this is a quick summary. There's a moving target. I mean, a couple weeks ago, it was 71 sites, but we've lost a few sites. We've got some new sites that are coming on. Um, and we've been trying hard to identify actually more sites in North America because there's some major gaps. I mean, we, we just lost Florida, we, we, uh, well, Miami, um, we've got Gainesville coming, um, but it's been really hard to find a, a sort of the right sort of person to work with there. We don't have a site in Texas, we don't have a site in Southern California, um, and so there's some major gaps, um, in, and, and these are important because they may see different populations. Um, and we've been expanding into Eastern Europe, and actually we're adding, about to add a site in Czechos, uh, well, in the Czech Republic. Um, so let me move on. So this shows the flow of the data. So we started out with a patient with a travel-related condition. This also can be a migrant or a refugee. They're seen at one of our sites. Um, the sites enter the data into a central database that's stored in the secure server at the CDC. But this project is actually managed by the International Society of Travel Medicine. So we do a data dump once a month into a secure server at ISTM. So we have a backup of the data there. Um, we have a data manager and, and then actually a team um, that, that are looking at the data. I get, I get an alert every day of all the new diagnoses that have been put in from the day before. Um, and we look at them and actually right now we're all excited because there's been a confirmed chikungunya case in El Salvador. And we haven't seen any chikungunya in El Salvador in a few years, but there's been a big outbreak in Paraguay. And so we're trying to see if they're connected in some way. We're actually trying to see if there's leftover samples so we can have that sequence. Um, and and then, as, and then there's sort of a reporting arm, which is we, you know, if we see something unusual, then we alert our network and our affiliate members. Um, we often will submit ProMed alerts, so the emerging disease uh, listserv. Um, and then TropNet is a, a European network of clinics. A public Health Agency Canada is, is also involved, and so we'll share data with them. Um, sometimes European CDC, sometimes WHO, and then there's another organization called EpiCor that also that can both um, put out calls for more information um, um, and has worked closely with ProMed in the past. So this is a summary of, of roughly where we are or where we were maybe about six months ago. I haven't updated, been able to update the total, but we're probably up to about 390,000 patients seen um, and over 475,000 total diagnoses. So you know, it's possible to have more than one diagnosis. Um, and, and these basically cover exposures in pretty much every country and territory around the world, um, even some that are close to Antarctica. There's not a lot of tropical diseases there, though. Um, but people on board cruise ships that have been there have, have become infected. Uh, this is, I just put this in for fun, just to so, show what happened during the pandemic. Things really slowed down, <laughs> not surprisingly. So this is our to tourism, you can see, just dropped off. Uh, migration VFR. So VFR stands for visiting friends and relatives. So these are like somebody who's born in, say, Africa that goes back to their country to visit family. That actually slowed down quite a bit, but that that and migration started to pick up um, much earlier than, than uh, tourism did. Um, and, and things have changed a lot, and we're really back on track with very busy um, sort of case numbers. Okay. Oops. So here are a couple examples of, of, of things we've done the last couple of years. And I'm, the top one is, is one where we were alerted to a yellow fever case um, at one of the sites. Um, and we're like, wow, we, 
we haven't seen yellow fever for ages. In fact, it turns out we'd never seen yellow fever diagnosis. Um, and this is somebody who'd been in Brazil, um, near Minas, uh, well, in a rural area of Minas Gerais. Um, another one came in um, at the same time. So we sent out an alert to the network and, and we heard about some cases in Chile to our Chilean site. Um, and then the site in Bucharest had a patient in the ICU that had florid hepatitis was yellow because of, of jaundice. And they tested for hepatitis A and B and E and C, and they, they weren't sure what the diagnosis was, but they hadn't tested for yellow fever until they got the alert. And then they tested, and that person you know, almost died, but actually survived. In the end, we had 10 cases, four out of the 10 died. So the sort of South American strain of yellow fever tends to be more, more you know, a little more uh, uh, dangerous in terms of case fatality. And all of them were from an area of Brazil that was not listed as having yellow fever risk including many of them had gone to Ile Grande, which is an island off of Rio. And so the end result was that working with the CDC and the Pan American Health Organization, the map of Brazil was remapped so that all these areas um, became yellow fever risk and people were advised to have the vaccine. So that was sort of a public health outcome of the data. Um, we've identified a number of chikungunya outbreaks in, in, in recent years, and this is one example. Um, but often there are outbreaks in places that may not have good surveillance systems or may have no surveillance systems at all. And that's how we're able to detect them. Um, this is a little bit of a different uh, thing. You know, typhoid fever um, and paratyphoid fever are common problems in many parts of the world. Um, and we did a, a multi-year analysis of all the cases we'd seen, you know, well over a thousand cases. But we also started collecting antimicrobial susceptibility, antibiotic susceptibility data in 2016 we were able to look at sort of the evolution of resistance um, using those data. And then more recently, this is a summary of, of US travelers. And the, this is, I think, the second time in, in two decades that the CDC has done a complete compilation of all the different kinds of diseases that travelers um, and migrants had presenting to GeoSentinel over a 10-year period. So these are just some, some examples of kinds of analyses we could do. Um, we're taking some new directions, um, and I'll say a little bit about machine learning, um, which unfortunately we started doing this before um, the sort of uh, NSF grant had started and, and it wasn't possible to do it here, um, yeah, but, but it's actually proving to be pretty interesting. Uh, we're doing enhanced surveillance and malaria resistance, so I'll say one word about that, and then we're also trying to take big databases and link them with our surveillance data, and we're doing this for dengue fever. So. This is a little bit about the machine learning. This is being done in collaboration with um, the Teaching and Research Institute of Data Science and Analytics at Eindhoven University. And, and basically, they're, they've been working on sort of taking 20 years of data, cleaning the data, um, and, and trying to use machine learning to detect unusual clusters um, and patterns um, that including Sentinel events. Um, and this is this is still in process. Um, we're, we're sort of we've seen some preliminary data from the results, but the, the problem is that for for 25 years, GeoSentinel has been basically done manually. Like I mean, I look at the data every day, and there's a team of us that look at the data and say, "Oh, that's unusual. Oh my gosh, there's a lot more dengue come out of Cuba. Let's check into this. When was the last time you saw that?" And then and then it's it's really crude, um, although it, it works because we're able to detect outbreaks, and it also depends on our, our members who alert us if there's something unusual. Um, and so this is basically the, the sort of approach they're taking a control chart based approach. Um, um, and then they're looking at sampling uncertainty of which there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, um, and um, the, basically they, they've started looking at Aedes born diseases. So things like dengue, chikungunya and Zika um, and um, have identified some previously overlooked outbreaks, so we we we, we don't catch everything. Um, and 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 actually, they they have also looked at COVID. Um, and so we we sort of missed COVID. Um, we we didn't really miss it; it was there. I, I went back and looked at the database in January 2020 and February 2020. We had a surge of ILI influenza-like illness cases from China and Macau. Um, and, and But the thing is that we, we, we didn't really detect it because we often have ILI from those parts of the world, um, and it's often due to influenza. And at that point in time, nobody had diagnostics, so we, we had no way to make a specific diagnosis. So that, that's a challenge and a, and a limitation also. 
Um, Summit is a really exciting project where we're trying to get pretty much every site on board to collect a sample when a patient comes in with malaria um, um, to, to take for sequencing to look for resistance genes, in particular for artemisinin resistance, which is starting to take off in some parts of Africa. I mean, Uganda, Ethiopia, Rwanda are seeing uh, resistance um, in, in a few other areas. And so we're, we're going to basically, we're trying to build a, a large network and actually collaborate outside of GeoSentinel with some national reference laboratories for malaria to, to make this more robust. And uh, Gates has expressed interest in this. So I think once we sort of show proof of principle, we're going to go to Gates for more funding. Um, and then finally, we, we've also been doing a secondary analysis, taking uh, many years of data to look at dengue um, and then uh, triangulating it with climatological data and, and weather data, data and, and showing how, um, how well travelers served as sentinels of, of uh, sort of outbreaks of dengue in different parts of the world. This is being done with uh, Joachim Rocklov and, and one of his postdocs, Stella Dath, at the University of Heidelberg. Um, and this is, this is a in process uh, slow down by fraternity leaves, but this sells back and it's, uh, it's gonna be quite interesting. So just to summarize, the GeoSentinel has been a useful platform for multi-country, uh, really sentinel disease um, outbreak detection. Um, we've now developed it into more of a research platform. Um, it's been especially useful for identifying sentinels emerging infectious disease transmission, um, but we're, we're moving more and more towards um, collecting samples and doing sequencing. And in fact, Nate, Nate Grubal, who some of you know, um, is, is working with us closely on both dengue and chikungunya. We've actually done some Zika work with him as well. Um, so I think that you know, there's going to be a lot more sort of complex analyses that can be done by tying together molecular epidemiology with the, the clinical epidemiology. And then the machine learning is sort of a new approach that, that we'll, we'll, we'll see how that works. So I'll stop there. Just oh, maybe just one thing. I'm, there's a lot of people that participate in GSML, so I need to acknowledge all the site directors around the world, the co-site directors. We work really closely with the CDC. This is funded by a cooperative agreement with the CDC. The International Society of Travel Medicine. We also get funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada. So, thank you. Did I stick to ten minutes? Yeah, a little more. Good. 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 Thanks. And uh, I will. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, please introduce our next. Excuse me, our next speaker, Dr. Heather Shu, is a pediatric hospitalist at Boston Medical Center and assistant professor of pediatrics in the Chobanian of, of I've never figured out how to say this right, basically the medical school here. <laughs> she can correct me. Um, she completed her medical degree at Harvard Medical School and an MPH from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, her research interests center around the impact of value-based care environments on health, health equity and the financial well-being of health care safety net, uh, particularly in the areas of infectious disease and substance use disorders. Um, relevantly today, she comes to us to talk about her work as it relates to this being the scientific director of the Boston Medical Center's clinical warehouse uh, data, uh, clinical data warehouse for research, and uh, discuss the role she played in developing a COVID data repository kind of in the height of the pandemic that was really nationally recognized and quite an impressive effort. So I'll turn it over to you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm suffering from lack of pockets on this bit. Um, so, uh, in contrast to that very global story you just heard, I'm going to tell you a very local story um, about how at Boston Medical Center we responded from a data infrastructure standpoint um, to the COVID pandemic. And um, I just want to acknowledge the rest of my team who really um, came together in response to the COVID pandemic and wouldn't have existed without the COVID pandemic in particular. Melissa Hoffman, who's our um, research informatics. Um, so uh, just to set the stage, the BMC Clinical Data Warehouse for Research has existed for about 15 to 20 years, um, uh, but um, uh, did not really blossom until the COVID pandemic. Um, it was one person um, kind of responding to data requests uh, up until that point. Um, an analyst, um, but no real oversight. Um, so the, the clinical data warehouse for research pulls in um, electronic health records data from BMC's EPIC instance, as well
well as community health center, electronic health care records data, um, as well as some internal department sources of data, tumor registry, um, and then uh, a whole bunch of static legacy data that aren't updated um, uh, as well. And then we have some work in progress related to other external data resources, including um, uh, DAC data, as well as large um, pharmacologic uh, databases, as well as PMC um, medical data care organization, wealth um, data. Um, so all of these are, are pulled into the PMC clinical data warehouse research, which you can think of as kind of a data quick scan of mostly clinical data at this point. It is not a static data warehouse. It doesn't have um, uh, any common data model that, uh, that the data are fed through. And so as um, uh, essentially as the electronic health record change, these are so these are the clinical data warehouse for research. And so you can imagine how with the onset of the pandemic, um, uh, as the electronic health record had to rapidly evolve to accommodate um, this new disease, um, we had to respond. Um, so the idea for creating kind of a virtual COVID repository came about right at the onset of the pandemic in um, March of 2020. Um, and this was in response essentially to me complaining that people were counting things wrong. And so um, we were getting wildly different numbers from the hospital for things like how many COVID patients were admitted, how many patients were intubated, um, and uh, and I knew that they were wrong because I was in the hospital hearing COVID patients um, and could, uh, could sort of tell by the SNP test that, uh, that our approach to that uh, wasn't up to SNP. And so I complained enough about it um, that, uh, that I was told to fix it and, um, and ended up um, kind of creating this idea along with one of the analysts in the clinical data warehouse to research the interest in hires. Um, for why don't we create code blocks to deal with this quicksand of data to try to corral it into sort of a common data model light um, in order to be able to count, um, first of all, cases more reliably um, as well as things like that. Um, I have a background um, in infectious disease epidemiology and have worked with the CDC on sepsis surveillance and so had some connections with the Friends there, um, like so many things happened in the early pandemic, kind of reached out by text message and said, hey, do you have any data from your safety net hospital setting on COVID? All the data that we're getting is either secondhand from China or from really well-resourced places, and we don't really have a handle on uh, on how the pandemic is affecting um, uh, people who are more marginalized. We can kind of know from experience that they will be harder hit, but we don't have anything to back that up. Um, and so, uh, as a result, we um, uh, we kind of had to really get on our horse about defining um, defining things properly. Um, so our vision was to create um, this electronic health records data repository that could be mobilized with things like this, like CDC reporting, um, and just ensure that we were providing accurate and high quality data that was clinically informed and systems informed. Um, so what I mean by that is knowing which tests were available when, what they're called, and how to assimilate that into a definition of who counts as being a COVID positive patient. Um, and also to have a system to form um, understanding of illness severity. So at the onset of the pandemic, um, uh, from a clinical management standpoint, the idea was intubate early. That changed pretty rapidly over the course of March and April. Um, and so using intubation with mechanical ventilation as a marker of illness severity was a moving target. So somebody who was intubated in March probably wouldn't be intubated um, in May. Um, and, uh, and so we wanted to be able to account for, um, for that kind of rapid change. Um, uh, and so we collaborated really closely with the lab um, in terms of trying to understand what tests and what supplies were available when, um, as well as uh, folks in infectious disease who are kind of rapidly turning over different protocols for patients, um, and trying to understand what the kind of location of care uh, nuances in terms of who is being asked which screening question and 
foreign. Um, uh, so we could assimilate that data as well. And then uh, really work on creating um, uh, what I call rapid cycle genotypes with the front front going. Um, and that was very much informed by what the CDC's COVID-19 Emergency Response at Risk Task Force was interested in. They were interested in knowing what underlying conditions were predisposing people both to get COVID in the first place and then to uh, progress the more severe disease. Um, and we, during this time, also received some funds um, from the BUCCSI um, to, to help uh, work on this. Um, and developed our first collaborations with the clinical trials uh, office. Um, and so what I mean when I say rapid cycle uh, patient phenotyping, this is basically um, uh, developing an electronic health record disease definition of an underlying condition. So we'll use this here as an example. Um, and so we were interested in this, this the CDC was very interested in, in knowing what proportion of patients um, uh, who had COVID um, had obesity, and and then looking at kind of the variation of disease in order to try to figure out is obesity a risk factor for severe COVID. Um, and so um, the approach that most people were using at this point was using ICD-10 codes um, uh, for obesity to to kind of label uh, patients as having obesity or not. Um, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that ICD-10 codes don't do a good job in identifying obesity. And so informed by that, we just, you know, the intuitive thing was, all right, we, are, we have electronic health records. We have patients measuring BMI. Why don't we add measuring BMI to the patient definition? And, and our count went up from finding 350 patients to finding over 1,000 patients. And so this is just kind of basic. <laughs> Epidemiology 101, but unfortunately, a lot of that was really ignored during our early stages of this pandemic. Um, and people were in such a rush for answers that I think that a lot of the basic principles kind of uh, went by the wayside in a lot of cases. Um, so, um, you can, this is just one example of, uh, of um, how we approach this, but we did the same thing for, um, for many other unknown. And ended up ultimately not only reporting into the CDC's um, COVID-19 emergency response at risk tax force, but also being asked to, um, to put together an MSWR report. And this was um, one of the first reports that came out that included inflammatory patients and that was a pre-existing and also had well-populated ranking data. Um, we only have about 10 percent patient data at the end, so they can get them to be really reasonable. For electronic health records, um, and then also um, included uh, a measure of persons experiencing homelessness. Um, um, and so, this is uh, this is one of the graphs from this paper. And these are this is a smattering of the underlying conditions that we did this rapid cycle um, phenotyping on. So it's not perfect, but I think it's going to be better than the first half of just using. Um, the ICD-10 codes, and it includes um, some conditions that are uh, especially important for our patient population, including some disease disorders and uh, sickle cell. Um, and so then, as the as the pandemic early months continued, um, there's a lot of really exciting work happening with biorepositories. And the folks that were using the data for the biorepositories were interested in knowing something clinically about the patients that they were receiving samples from. And so we launched a new workflow with what is now the lab core to link their coded samples um, with our um, with clinical data um, from the electronic health record. Um, and so <clears throat> This um, uh, this was um, kind of a typical fast-moving data science story in that it started out with the lab for having Excel spreadsheets um, 
that were manually triggered and kind of has evolved into something that's much more automated. Um, uh, we now have uh, pretty well developed workflows for providing clinical data with and without prospective health information um, so that it can be shared outside of the immediate care provider system. Um, and then, um, uh, kind of with every single project that we did within this space, we would uh, we would curate kind of a new pocket of the clinical data, and then that one would be sort of added back to the whole block. Whole block. Uh, and then, um, as things have progressed over the past couple of years, we, as of um, this past September, we uh, we provided data for 147 um, different COVID-specific research projects um, among 79 research teams. About 25% of all um, clinical data warehouse for research data requests obtained some kind of COVID data, so it might be a, a project that isn't actually about COVID, but they whether uh, what percentage of their cohort is COVID positive. Um, and then we have continued collaboration with the clinical trials office um, in order to enhance the inventory and ask um, for participation in clinical trials because that was a, a bit of a pain point um, that uh, that required more um, attention to resources that we identified particularly early in the pandemic when we were being overwhelmed for um, for a lot of different um, so, just to kind of summarize some lessons learned, um, uh, attention to data uh, uh, and research infrastructure uh, in a safety net hospital in particular is really um, important for health equity. We were really the only safety net um, hospital aside from Brady that provided any data to the CDC um, uh, during the early months of the pandemic. Um, and uh, and by not having our patients represented, we've missed opportunities to help really provide for them. Um, and then just working to develop this virtual repository really changed the way that the institution was looking at the clinical data warehouse for research. And so this is still very much a work in progress. We're not where we want to be, but we've made, I think, really important steps in terms of understanding the importance of data curation and um, uh, definitions um, and really having an actual data strategy rather than just kind of ad hoc data um, extraction for individual projects. And then um, this also helped launch some really wonderful new collaborations um, to support full spectrum translational research, including uh, our work with the clinical trials office as well as the labs. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker. Dr. Yanis Paskalides is a distinguished professor in the College of Engineering at Boston University and directs the Hurry Institute. Uh, he has joint appointments in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the Division of Systems Engineering, and the Department of Biomedical Engineering. He's also the founding professor of the Computing and Data Sciences. Um, Dr. Paskalides, uh, research focuses a lot in the areas of control sy systems and control optimization, machine learning networks, computational biology, and computational medicine. Uh, his list of awards and honors is numerous, and I will instead give him more time to speak rather than attempt to capture all of those. But needless to say, he has uh, been widely recognized for his really outstanding work. Um, so turn it over to you, Jan. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I'll give you once we could move it. Okay. So I'll give you uh, an overview of some of the work that we've been doing and uh, uh, in using AI and uh, developing new AI methods in the service of uh, pandemic science. And uh, I'll discuss uh, three specific applications. 
So, uh, so first, I'll uh, briefly talk about some of the work that we did in developing models for that predicted level of care for patients that uh, were infected by COVID. They are actually benefiting very much by the work uh, Heather's group and the clinical data warehouse. And then I'll talk about two uh, works that we're now uh, developing. So early detection of a local disease outbreak and then using LLMs. So these are large language models for looking at the literature and finding important information and uh, I'll provide the context. So we we are uh, got involved in analyzing quite a bit of uh, different data sets. And here you see a listing of the papers and the data sets that we worked with uh, during the pandemic. And these included some very large uh, na national data sets, one from Mexico and the another one from Brazil, uh, a smaller data set from uh, Wuhan, which was the beginning of the uh, epidemic. Uh, and then I'll talk very briefly about the most recent work, which uh, was with uh, using BMC data, uh, leveraging data from the clinical data warehouse. And I think what was interesting, we developed models that uh, were predicting hospitalizations, predicting ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and also mortality. Uh, the BMC data set was all of the BMC uh, COVID infected patients during 2020, about 7,000 of those, and you see some basic statistics on the slide about those individuals. And we had everything, including demographics, vitals, uh, anything that happened during a possible hospitalization. And we also had hospital occupancy data, including general hospital occupancy data, but also uh, the COVID uh, uh, occupancy data at the hospital. And we also, and I think that is what makes it a bit more interesting, we had access to uh, metrics, uh, social determinants of health, uh, using a study the, the Thrive survey that uh, BMC applies to all of the patients that have an encounter. So I'll show you one of the models. Uh, so we developed a model that uh, was predicting whether someone was going to be hospitalized. And the numbers that you see on the slide are AUC, so area under, under the curve. So that's a metric of how accurate the model is. And you can see that it can be fairly accurate using fairly sophisticated uh, uh, decision trees. In fact, this is a collection of decision trees uh, type of method. But what is also interesting is that fairly simple models like logistic regression, if you are careful in terms of selecting the variables and there are systematic ways in which you can do that, they can give you pretty good accuracy. And uh, uh, also, the simpler methods like logistic regression, they provide you with a list of variables that are driving these decisions. And the list of variables is important uh, and interesting to see and also gives uh, interpretability to, to the model. What we found was that, in fact, the hospitalization model was very much biased. So the naive model that uh, we first developed had uh, twice as much probability of falsely predicting that the black individual was going to be hospitalized and uh, uh, had uh, also a significantly higher probability of a false negative rate for white patients. So in some sense, the model was very eager to predict that the black individual was going to be hospitalized and make a mistake in, in doing so. Uh, so we developed methods to address this uh, sort of inequity or bias in uh, the model. And we sort of intervened, and I will not show you the final model, but these uh, percentages of these errors can be equalized among the two, the two cohorts. So I'll move into the next topic. So GPT uh, stands for a Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So this is a, a new deep learning model is in fact the technology behind chat GPT. Uh, and it turns out that it's not, these types of models are not only good in language, but any other sequence 
can be used to train this model and the model can be trained in order to predict the next entry in the sequence. So like ChatGPT has been trained, you give it uh, some piece of text to predict the next word in the text. In a very similar way, you can train models of this type to predict the next entry in the sequence. So what we did is uh, we used this GPT model and we provided as input information about the state of the patient during hospitalization, including everything that is available and is known about that patient, including demographics, clinical variables, uh, any ICU admissions, anything that happens to the patient in the hospital. And we sort of split it the time to, of the hospitalization into different intervals. And we sort of summarize the state of the patient within each one of these intervals. So the model can therefore be trained to predict what will happen next to the patient. And now that type of model can be used very successfully for so-called anomaly detection. And what I mean by anomaly detection, so essentially we want to replace the, or, or uh, help the astute physician that will understand that maybe there is something strange happening because I have this group of four, five, six patients that have symptoms that do not look typical, I haven't seen before, and maybe this will be uh, an early detection signal for a potentially new outbreak. And uh, in order to test whether the model and the way in which this can, can be done, is essentially you can look at how well the model fits a new patient that you present. And if the model doesn't fit a new patient very well, that may be a cause of concern because the model has been trained for you know thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients to predict what will happen next to the patient. So we tested this approach uh, by training a model that first uh, was trained on the time period before the start of the COVID pandemic. Uh, again, this is using BMC data. And then we, we have only one uh, instance, the beginning of the pandemic at BMC. We tested whether the model would have been successful in very early on predicting that something unusual was going on. And uh, there are so different variables that you can look at. So you can look at uh, mortality, you can look at uh, ICU admissions, you can look at a variety of different variables that may show uh, being unusual. And the model, uh, for instance, was extremely accurate in predicting death and also was fairly accurate in this anomaly detection uh, use. Uh, so you can see an AUC on the order of 87% in predicting unusual ICU admissions. Uh, so, and you can plot sort of this type of score that the model is producing, and you can sort of see that, you know, very quickly predicted the beginning of the COVID pandemic at BMC and also predicting some of the following waves that were due to variants of the virus. Uh, not such a strong signal, but still you can sort of see that it sort of predicts, uh, identifies those as being anomaly. So the final example of use of AI uh, involves actually using these large language language models uh, in the way that they have been originally developed, and specifically uh, in this work, we have used uh, ChatGPT. So, if a new virus comes up, it is unlikely that it will be a completely novel virus, right? So, even SARS CoV 2, there were earlier coronaviruses that were present. And in fact, a lot of the therapeutics and the vaccines were developed benefited from that earlier work. So the Paxlovid that was developed by Pfizer was essentially based on research that was done on earlier coronaviruses. So if something new comes up and is sequenced and identified, 
then they would be erased, try to understand what is there in the literature that relates to the new pathogen that has appeared and how we can leverage the literature in developing new vaccines, developing new drugs and new therapeutics. So the literature, however, is pretty vast. So that shows you the, so this is in thousands of papers for SARS-CoV-2 starting from 2020. Uh, now we, in, if you look in PubMed, we are on the order of 200,000 or so papers. Uh, and obviously manually reviewing uh, this vast literature is impossible. You need uh, a huge group. And even then it will not be a comprehensive review of the literature. So one can leverage these large language models and we have developed a new pipeline that uh, the idea is you take the abstract, the title of the paper and important keywords, and you present it to ChatGPT and you do quite a bit of smart prompting of ChatGPT to make it perform better than without these types of techniques. And in this specific application, we asked whether the abstract that we are presenting uh, describes a, a new target, a target for uh, developing a drug, and whether this target has been validated in a laboratory setting because we didn't want just a simple target without any validation. And two prompting techniques were quite important, so chain of thought and unsampling. So what is chain of thought? Actually, if you ask ChatGPT to show you its work, it tends to be much more accurate than if you don't ask that. So essentially you ask it, can you provide me with an explanation and your way of that you thought about giving me the answer and then give me the answer. It's like your teenager that you ask them to solve a mathematical problem and they may give you initially the wrong answer, but then if you ask them, can you explain how you came up with that answer, then you usually get a much more accurate answer. <clears throat> the second idea is that, you know, the output of these models is probabilistic. So you can ask the same question twice and you may get a different answer. And in fact, if you answer, ask more and more, uh, and you do a majority voting of the answer, then you tend to improve the accuracy. So using these and some other ideas that I will not explain, um, so we are finalizing a paper. We test it uh, on finding tra drug targets for SARS-CoV-2 and for NIPA. Uh, and you can see that uh, we compare the performance of these models to uh, a group of experts that reviewed these papers or a smaller sample of these papers. And you can see fairly significant agreement. So for SARS-CoV-2, uh, accuracy is on the order of 90 to 93% for NIPA because there are not so that, that many papers on NIPA, a bit less, but still, you know, the, uh, the uh, sort of the lesson, I guess, or the take home message is that these large language models can be extremely helpful as research assistants to understand the literature and identify those papers that you actually need to read because they are the more relevant for what you may be looking for. So I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, obviously, many individuals have been involved in this, uh, in this work. Uh, Heather uh, is there because uh, she was uh, instrumental in getting us data and was involved in the paper we wrote for uh, the BMC data. So thank you for your attention.